Thank you all for coming. So the reason this library exists and we're a municipal library is to support democracies. So we want to have several forums maybe every month. And this is the second of them. And we're hoping that you will learn something and help the library um, support democracies. Welcome to the Democracy Forum. This is every first Monday of the month at the library. We're really happy to be here. We've been at the Strolling of the Heifers for a couple of years, and we're still there, but we're very happy to be able to uh, reach more people here at the library. Uh, so I want to thank the library and STAR for helping us set this up. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Tim Kipp, who's giving tonight's presentation. Tim taught history and political science and law for 39 years, and he has been a political activist since the 1960s, starting with the civil rights movement and peace movements. His first political campaign was in 1968 and continues to this day. Welcome, Tim. I should add that that political campaign in 68, it's not the same one that I'm working on now. <laughs> Although maybe it is. So um, I'm kind of tied into this, but I may be able to speak to you without, without amplification, but we'll see. Just let me know if it's, if it's a problem. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> my intention is to talk about the process, the history of voter exclusion and s suppression in the United States. It's not a small subject. I kind of felt like in doing the research, and I've been researching this on and off for years, it's kind of like uh, tuning your carburetor while you're driving your car. Because every time you open up the Times, or open up the newspaper, there, uh, there's another article that looks germane to what I'm talking about. So I will try to give you some broad outlines and then dip into some specifics, and then hopefully it will, be, uh, it will make some sense to you. What we want to do then is to, I'm, I'm going to have a short, and in the end would have, okay, what reforms are happening now? And uh, then what we wanted to do was just get a discussion going. People will throw out ideas of what can be done, how can we strengthen this democracy, and, uh, and in, engage our, our, each other in a, in a uh, conversation, dialogue, which is what democracy is about. So <clears throat> two themes that I want to develop here. One is the dynamic of the dynamic of democracy, and all which which is which is a process. It is not a noun. It is not a static condition. If we look at it as a static condition, we look at democracy in the wrong light. We look at it as as something that can die, can wither, it can get um, get go off the off the rails. So uh, what you'll see here starting from the time of the uh, Constitution, is an expansion, periods of expansion, uh, elaborating on democracy, and then periods of contraction. And I would argue now, really, uh, in, in the last 20 years, we're in a period of contraction. That may imply cyclical, I'm not sure. Uh, but there certainly have been other cycles in our history where there's been expansion, and then reaction, expansion, contraction, okay? Um, the other theme I want to develop is the color line. Now that was a, a term first used by one of our, our great uh, Americans, a guy named Frederick Douglass, I'm sure you all know his name. In 1881, he penned a, an essay called The Color Line. And he, he argues that it is color and color alone. He didn't use race because he didn't believe in race concept either, and I don't, it's a, it's a, it's a color concept, that it is the race, it will define which direction this democracy goes in. And picking up on that, in 1903, uh, William Edward Burkhardt Du Bois 
wrote The Soul of Black Folks, one of the giants of American history, uh, intellectual, activist, socialist. And <clears throat> he described the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. And he goes on to describe the veil, the veil that's before the eyes of the American people and the white people the veil that prevents them from seeing the goodness, the honesty, the dignity of the black man and woman, all right? He also says that veil covers the eyes of African Americans as well. And pri primarily, they won't see a true vision of themselves as reflected in a larger uh, racist culture. So that's, that's where I wanna go with this. The, um, <clears throat> As I've said, the, uh, if you look at our history, our history is a constant struggle for democracy. What an exciting prospect. What an extraordinary prospect. I think democracy is the greatest invention of humans have ever, ever uh, created. But we ha it's not a static situation. We have to keep fighting for it over and over again in little battles and large battles, as we, we, can, we can see that playing out on every day in our lives. As Douglas said, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing. It never has, it never will. And therefore, it's our obligation as responsible citizens, I'm not gonna lecture you on this, because um, you know damn well, but it is our obligation to make sure that we fulfill those promises of democracy. By studying the history of, the vo of voting in the United States, you get, you get uh, vivid examples of the growth and the, in the uh, contraction of democracy, you also get, it's a metaphor for who we are and our struggles to try to become more democratic. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So, in the, the Constitution is pretty silent on how we run elections. Article 1, Section 4 speaks as a short section on that Congress has the power, the ability, responsibility to uh, regulate time and manner of congressional, congressional elections. Primarily, the Constitution uh, gives the authority to run elections to the states. And that's what both, both a strength and a weakness. And it depends on what state it is, what, what that state wants to do with the franchise, how they want to expand it or contract it. And, um, and that you'll see over time in certain regions in our country, those were two very different uh, dynamics. The uh, first federal regulation came in 17, excuse me, 1870 with the 15th Amendment, which was, oh, what a crowd. The 17th, not that, did I say 17th? The 15th Amendment, sorry. Okay, that is uh, African American males get the right to vote. Okay, and I'll be talking a little bit more in the context of the, of those, uh, the, the uh, Civil War amendments. That, that, uh, that um, amendment was upheld by statute since 1879 and then in 1932, confirming that yes, Congress has that ability and responsibility to conduct elections when necessary. What we do know is a history of exclusion from the start of our country. And this, this, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, it's pretty well known. Women, Native Americans, African Americans, white males without property, and immigrants were excluded from the right to vote. Um, the Naturalization Act of Immigrants in 1795 limited citizenship to, quote, free white persons of good moral character and who had resided in the United States for five years. Just on that alone, I'm not sure any of us would qualify. I'm not sure. Um, all right. So what happens by uh, um, 18, uh, excuse me, 1787, emerging in the next 20 years is they're slowly the states are going to start expanding the rights of white males. I have to keep keep that in mind. So they would start eschewing property rights as a standard, and say that, well, you, are, you have the right because you are, you are a citizen of the United States, a right as a male citizen, I should say, a white male citizen. By 1856, most states had adopted a universal white male suffrage. Some of the states had some lingering 
lingering poll tax requirements up into the 20th century. In 1841, a guy named Thomas Dorr, D-O-R-R, led a revolt in Rhode Island. And it was an armed military revolt to get the right to vote, to overcome the charter, their colonial charter, that said only white males with property had the right to vote. It was a failed, it failed, but um, it's, it's emblematic of the struggle for democracy, whether you're, uh, you know, on, on whatever state you're in. <clears throat> the second, the, the biggest wave of rights for African Americans occurs right after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. An extraordinary time in our history. An amazing, it was, a, it was this grand social engineering to me in the most positive way to say we can as a society expand and give rights to people if, even if they're not white males. It was an amazing time led by Republicans Thaddeus Stevens and Republican uh, Charles Sumner. And so, so we have what we call Reconstruction or what Du Bois called Black Reconstruction. You saw this period of explosion of political power of African Americans in the South. They had the right to vote, and guess who they voted for? They voted for themselves. My, oh my, all right? 600 uh, black members in the state legislatures throughout the South. 16 in the U.S. Senate, excuse me, in the U.S. House, two in the U.S. Senate. It wasn't until the Compromise of 1877, and I'm not gonna go through the weeds of all that, but that is kind of the symbolic point of when uh, Reconstruction uh, for African Americans ends and the redeemers, the white redeemers, take back control of the South as Republicans basically give up supporting blacks and, and give the, uh, de the Democrats back the South uh, because at this point they had, they had bargained that, they would, that the uh, Reconstruction governments would now not be militarily occupied by the federal government, so there were seven states that were occupied by the federal government um, in a military, in a military style government, and they would be that way until the uh, those uh, old Confederate states pledged uh, uh, loyalty to the Constitution and allowed for uh, black rights. It's we call it. Uh, uh, Eric Foner calls it the second founding of the country, and I think that's not an, I don't think that's an understatement. If you want to read some great material on, on this era, I would recommend uh, Eric Foner from um, Columbia. The, uh, so, what, so what's the upshot of all this? So we have this explosion of African Americans in Congress at the time. What an amazing thing. But what, what do you think the reaction is? What, what is the reaction? You probably know. What happens in the South? The rise of Jim Crow will come about gradually, gradually, no, I shouldn't say that, within a period of about 10 years, so it's not that gradual, all right, uh, as a reaction to uh, this condition of, of an expansive rights of African Americans. So you have well, what Crane Britton, writing in the 1930s about revolution, said a Thermidorian reaction. So. The society gives or, 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 the, or the, the people fight for and win political economic rights. And then there's a, there's a backlash. And we've heard about backlashes. We've experienced them before. And that's what happened. And the rise of Jim Crow is an expression of that, a manifestation of that, of that backlash. And so what we'll have, uh, many historians will use this terminology, we don't have slavery anymore. We have neo-slavery, all right? So it's, a, it's slavery of a different form. And in some ways can be very dangerous because people think that, oh, the, the Africans are freed now, so it's not a problem. Just like after the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. Um, also, if you look at the, the, the uh, ebb and flow of history, it's, it's a dialectic. And this is what Marx would call this a dialectic, a thesis, and, and antithesis, or, um, and synthesis, where you, you gain some ground and then there's an oppositional force. 
and then you gain more ground and there's an oppositional force. He would argue, as would uh, uh, Hegel and Kant, that that's how history moves. Well, I think this is a classic example of that. If you look at the pattern of voting rights in the United States, it is a, it is a pattern of this gains and losses, fights and then retrenches, advances and retreats. So, uh, probably the emblematic of this white response was the Mississippi Plan. And the Mississippi Plan basically codified uh, into law the, uh, the whole system of segregation. And it became a model for other southern states. And uh, so the, if you, the, the, all that, that we know about segregation in terms of unemployment and voting and education and legal system and housing and public facilities and so forth really starts really gelling at this time and starts spreading. It, the germs of this start spreading. And there, there will be within, within the Jim Crow system two basic ways that they will redeem the South. That was the terminology that was used. They were the redeemers. We're going to redeem the old ways of the South. One was the use of terrorism, and the other was the legal system. So we know about the Klan. We know about the Klan and its many clones. Uh, and we know that you know, the amount of lynching in 70 years, maybe near 5,000 uh, African Americans were lynched. Uh, we, know about, we know about racial cleansing of towns where they would attack black neighborhoods, burn the town, and they'd drive them out. And that, that, was gonna, that was gonna cleanse the town. We had famous uh, uprisings against African Americans of Colfax, Louisiana, and OC, Florida, and Chicago, East St. Louis, Detroit, Washington, D.C., and this is all before uh, World War I. We had sundown towns. You know what that term is? If you, were, if you were black and you were in town when the sun was down, your life is in danger. There were, uh, one estimate is two to 3,000 sundown towns in the United States from the, from the uh, late 1800s to the 1950s, uh, mainly in the South and in the West. Now, if we look at, we look at uh, a legal structure of, of uh, suppression, I'm just gonna read off some of the things that we're familiar with. I won't go into the, into the details unless you're dying to hear them. Uh, poll tax became a, a very powerful tool wasn't very expensive. It wasn't wasn't that much to uh, to implement or to you know to pay. But poll tax in some states were cumulative, and if you didn't pay them, you could be you that could be a form of debt, and it would be accumulative. Even though you know you have the choice whether or not you're to vote, the grandfather clause you know about literacy tests. I was going to give you one, but I think I'll I'll save that. Um, I used to give them to my students. And uh, quite interesting. Multi-box system, uh, where they're very convoluted and, and difficult uh, ballot box system to navigate. And they were all on, on no Australian ballots, meaning you know what that means, that the Australian ballot is the secret ballot. These are all public. And all, so you knew, that the, the officials knew exactly who you were voting for. Vagrancy laws, debt peonage system, and uh, white primaries. So, what, to step back from all that and not going through all those details, it was a very, very effective system of suppression. It worked. It absolutely worked. Uh, 1880, in Alabama, black vote, voting uh, registrants were 180,000. By 1899, 3,000. In Louisiana, it was 130,000, it was down to 1,300, and, the st and, the, and it goes on and on. Let me see here. Uh, so when you, when you use all of these extra legal uh, systems in, of terror and then using the legal system, you will find the fruits of it uh, are effective. Let me read you a, what I found to be an amazing quote from a character who was from South Carolina, his name is Ben Tillman, he was, his nickname was Pitchfork. 
He was a governor and a senator, and Pitchfork was named such because he threatened people with a pitchfork, and you can guess which people we're talking about. So here's a quote from Van. We have done our level best. We have scratched our heads to find out how we could eliminate the last one of them. We stuffed ballots, we shot them, we were, and we're not, we were not ashamed of it. Going on. We organized the Democratic Party with one plank and one plank only, namely that this is a white man's country and a white man must govern it. What I like about these things is there's nothing nuanced about it. You know where they stand. Even, even I can figure that out. Uh, other federal regulations that were uh, in a positive way was the 17th Amendment, 1913, which gave uh, us the ability to vote for our senators. Up to, that, up to 1913, we didn't vote for senators. They were, they were voted by the state legislature or chosen. All right. Another positive one, 1924, the Snyder Act gave Native Americans the right to vote for the first time. Although in 2018, North Dakota uh, court upheld a law to require Native Americans to have street addresses and not just post, post boxes. And for those who know anything about Indian culture, they don't have specific street addresses, they have post office boxes. And that was upheld by the Roberts Court. It's very interesting, these laws that have, we've been talking about and strategies uh, are always presented as being race neutral. We are, we're a race neutral, we're not targeting anyone. What we're doing is we are providing integrity for the system. We're protecting the system. We don't want illegal people voting. And that, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that concept, for sure, but it's about how you implement it. So by 1952, only 20% of Southern blacks were registered to vote. That would change in 65 and then up through the late 60s. In 1971, the, the franchise was again expanded for 18-year-olds. And in Brattleboro, we've expanded that to 17-year-olds, I do believe, because in uh, primaries, I think, or in local elections, local elections. Electoral college, uh, is, is, in my view, is a, is a disaster. It is, we've had five minority presidents uh, who've lost, who lost the, uh, the uh, popular vote, but won because of the electoral college. Um, if we look at the modern era now in terms of uh, we're now into the civil rights movement, and now we have a parallel with what we had at right uh, during the time of the uh, Black Reconstruction. Most powerful movement of social movement in our country was the civil rights movement, really starting in the 40s, uh, during and after World War II, going through the 60s, and some of us feel like it's still going on, and it should be. There are a series of acts in a very positive way passed by Congress, some in the Republican uh, under Eisenhower, 1957, the Civil Rights Act. Then 1960, that was under Eisenhower. Then 64 Act under Johnson. And in 1962, the 24th Amendment, which was the poll tax. Well, all of these, uh, these acts that I just listed gave incremental improvements to expanding the franchise. A positive thing, all right? And then we have the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I think it is one of the most democratic uh, pieces of legislation this country has ever, ever produced. And I kind of look at it as, uh, if, I, 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 if I connect up Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, with the 65 Voting Rights Act, you have an expression of very strong ethical democracy. You have people saying, yes, we are all in this together. So if you look at Dred Scott in 1857 and then Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, you have just the opposite. You have some of the low water marks uh, in, in judicial history in terms of black rights coming with Scott and the Ferguson case, the Plessy case, and then you have Brown and then you have the Voting Rights Act. So you have this, 
this, again, you have that action and then a reaction. And, and this, this is why, even though I'm a very critical of our culture, our political economy, I'm still an optimist because there is enough room, there is enough room for us to, to make changes. Um, so the Voting Rights Act expanded exponentially the role of the federal government to run elections. They could determine if there were patterns of, of discrimination in a voting district or in a state. It, it, it could, some states only had some districts were, were, uh, were fingered for being discriminatory. Others was all, was all, all the states. And uh, so this act empowered the federal government through the Justice Department to step in, make changes, order changes, and have federal registrars, literally have feds coming in and register people to vote, oversee the electoral process. And there's something called Section 5, preclearance. Preclearance pre meant that in order for a, a, uh, a state to change an election law, they had to get permission from the federal government to make sure it complied with the guidelines under the 65 Act. Amazing. Impact of such? Total black registration was 62% by the end of the 1960s, which was comparable to whites. That's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement. Mississippi, 1964, 10% of blacks were uh, registered. By 1968, 60%. Alabama, in, in 1964, 24% were registered. By 1968, 57% were. Oh, here we go again. Here's that backlash again. Here's that Thermidorian reaction. Here's that dialectic. So what is the response? After, after uh, the, the Voting Rights Act is passed, and, and also Lyndon Johnson supports, of course, the, more, the most comprehensive general uh, um, Civil Rights Act, the 64 Act, you know what, he turns to his colleagues and says, well, we, Democrats just lost the South. And he was right. Because what will happen then is uh, later on in the Nixon administration, we'll start implementing something called the Southern Strategy, and I'll get to that in a minute. But this Southern uh, and mainly Southern backlash to the civil rights movement and, and conservative cultural resistance was now afoot. Both Nixon and Reagan attempted to weaken or and or destroy, depending upon who you read, the Voting Rights Act, either by uh, weakening it or fighting reauthorization. They'd like to just as, as well get rid of it. The Southern strategy, which really, you know, we, we attribute it to Nixon, but it really was started by Barry Goldwater in the early 60s, is the use, the idea of using race and fear and classism to convert Southern Democrats, who historically have been the conservatives and so forth, to the Republican Party. And so this Southern strategy goes on for years, and this, is, this explains why the South is Republican today. Um, as opposed to being democratic. Um, in addition to the Southern strategy, uh, the war on drugs and crime would be used as a weapon or would be weaponized to divide and weaken uh, minorities in this country. Nixon and Reagan, the war on drugs and crime, crime was, was a, a, a wedge used to divide people. Let me read you a quote. By getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, could raid their homes, we could break up their meetings and vilify them. Now that wasn't a Black Panther. That wasn't Huey Newton speaking. That was John Ehrlichman. Anybody remember who John Ehrlichman was? One of Nixon's key advisors. And uh, Reagan will, will take off on that motif um, in the 80s in terms of uh, that, that war on drugs and the war on crime. Another contributing factor to this was the Clinton policy, supported by 
Clinton, and we're paying for it today. And that is the 1994 Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, which institutionalized the, the uh, largest surge of African Americans and other people of color to be placed in cages. Decimating communities, uh, promoting this uh, gave rise to use of gangs and unemployment and conflicts between uh, whites and, and uh, blacks and also with the police. Um, I would re recommend uh, Michelle Alexander's book. It's now in its, uh, it's, uh, it's 10 years old. It's now it's been reissued. It's an incredible book called The New Jim Crow about the institutionalization of the Southern strategy and how you use that as a wedge to shift people from uh, voting uh, Democrat to voting Republican. In addition, at the same time, we have, these, we have a, a move for ideological transformation of the Supreme Court of the United States. In 1971, Lewis Powell, who was then a corporate lawyer, penned a long memo at, uh, advocating a corporate political call to arms. So this is what we have to do. We have, this, we have the people in the streets. We have the anti-war movement. We have the, we have the civil rights movement. And now we have women are marching. Is that we in America, we have, uh, who want to hold on to what we believe and value, that we have to organize ourselves. And it was at that point, it's a fascinating blueprint, it was at that point that the, uh, the more the business community got much more organized, the corporate business community got much more organized to facilitate a surge in uh, promoting a conservative agenda. All fair and good. I'm not, you know, that's, that's all fair. There's nothing illegal about that. But I'm just giving you the, the outlines of the history. Uh, so starting with Nixon, conservatives use wedge issues, abortion, Crime, drugs, hippies, women's lib, family values, and religion to shift the ideological balance of the court, which was in itself a repudiation of the liberal Warren court. All right, because they felt, and, and it, it's all, again, all fair and good, uh, they felt that the Warren court was much too far to the left, giving way too much uh, power to the, uh, to the criminals and not enough to the, to the victims. And that's in a, in a in a nutshell. Since Reagan, excuse me, since uh, Nixon Republicans were very effective campaign to shift the court, both the Supreme Court and the appellate courts. I should add that Obama has been criticized by people like us on the left for not taking advantage of his power of appointment in the appellate courts. Whereas if you look at what's happened with, with Trump and company, they're very, very effective in getting their people on the bench throughout this land. And we will be feeling the Trump court for a long time to come. Let me just look at some of the two youngest members. Also look at the Merrick Garland case, if you remember that. Obama appointee, nominee, excuse me, who uh, the Republican uh, uh, leader would not even help hold hearings. He stonewalled that. Sound familiar? So in the, uh, in the late 90s up to today, we've had a series of Supreme Court cases and statutes that um, either enhance or, or weaken the, 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 uh, the franchise. And what I observed was that whether, when a Supreme Court decision comes down, depending upon what state and who is in charge of that state, they can interpret what that means in fundamentally wholly different ways. So those who want to expand African American rights and minority rights will interpret that law uh, that thusly. Those who do not want to can interpret it the way they want to. Or it's what I call cui bono, who is, who, who is benefiting? So how it's interpreted, the purpose of the law um, or the ruling will determine by those people themselves what will be the outcome of that. So some state legislators will use the rulings and laws for, I think, positive results expanding the franchise, and others will use it for suppression. There's nothing universal. Remember, the states control the electoral process. It's not the federal government. 
in a, uh, and I think a very uh, positive uh, uh, effort to expand the franchise in 1993, the National Voter Registration Act, what we all know as motor voter, which mean that you, and once you get your license, you automatically can then uh, be registered. It was a phenomenal piece of legislation to expand the franchise. In three years after Motor Voter, national registration increased to 73%, which was the highest since 1960. But in the hands of, of another state, that could be problematic. Alabama, at that time, decided that one way to combat that, because they weren't real comfortable with having that, those people voting, was to reduce the number of de uh, Department of Motor Vehicle offices in poor areas. In 2002, under the Bush administration, the Help America Vote Act, again, another very, uh, a, a very important uh, piece of legislation, federal from, uh, assistance for, for election administration, for data maintenance, voting machines, clearinghouse for elections, and they use this was for the protection of integrity of our voting system. Now that becomes problematic. It be, can become in the wrong hands, in my view, in the wrong hands, can be uh, used as a justification for we're gonna, we are going to make sure that these elections are not fraudulent, I have no problem with that, but we're gonna do it our way we're going to ha we have a certain way that we're going to do it. In 2008, and I'll, I'll be getting to that. In 2008, Crawford versus Marion in Indiana, the Seventh Circuit upheld the legality of voter ID laws. Now we're talking voter ID laws. And this is one of the most, I believe, the most destructive uh, uh, tools for limiting the franchise. The, uh, in 2013, the Supreme Court, in a, again, I think in an infamous decision, equivalent to Citizens United in 2010, that opened up citizens, citizens uh, a, a corporate uh, re, um, funding of elections with virtually no uh, regulation. Well, Shelby versus Holder, Eric Holder was Obama's uh, uh, AG, the Supreme Court, in vis in, this is my interpretation, but I, I'm not uh, going out on a limb here. They inviscerate the 1965 Voting Rights Act by eliminating Section 5, the preclearance. Therefore, the federal government does not have the right to review uh, any discriminatory patterns that are happening in your locality or in your state. States now were free to pass changes in voting laws, which meant in those states that wanted to do it, less federal regulation of historically discriminatory voting patterns. Chief Justice Roberts at the time, and he wrote the majority on this, he said, quote, and it's a direct quote, voting discrimination is largely a thing of the past, unquote. So immediately after the, the, the Shelby decision, and they knew, people knew that the uh, uh, secretaries of state knew it was coming, there were 99 new, in, 19, in 2017, 99 new suppression bills, uh, including purging, were introduced in 31 Republican states. The impact of Shelby, according to, if you had to read one book on voter suppression, this just came out. I would recommend Gilda Daniels. I think it's excellent. Uh, and she says, the courts no longer served as a defense of voting rights in the darkness of discrimination. Voter turnout will plummet. And a study done by the Brennan Center of NYU Law said 2014 to 2016, 16 million voters were purged. This was a 33 increase of purges from the, from the 06 and 08 uh, time. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing all right. Okay. You still with me? You're having fun? So if I tell a joke and you're overcome by mirth, go ahead and let it out. You know, it's good. It's, cathar it's cathartic for you. In 2018, the Husted versus A. Philip Randolph Institute 
uh, this was a Supreme Court case, uh, ruled that you could purge inactive voters. Have you heard of this one? This one kills me. In other words, they can say, if you, vis you didn't vote the last two years, we can say, well, you're inactive, you have to re-register. Or maybe it's four years, depending upon what state we're talking about. And as you know, registration in many states is very complicated. And we'll talk about voter ID as well as purging. Uh, the uh, Vermont, oh, you gotta love Vermont. That's one of the easiest place to register to vote. You have a question? No, okay, I did. All right, um, it is, and you can do same day registration. You don't have to bring your birth certificate. You don't need your blood type. You don't need your grandfather's weight. You could just come in and declare yourself a citizen. I live here in Brattleboro. Damn troublemakers, those Vermonters. Okay, so the patterns of, of suppression since 2000, and here I'm trying to look at those patterns for you, because I'm throwing a lot at you, is voter identification laws related to fraud, the purging of voter rolls, and gerrymandering. And then there's a lot of others, other techniques that are sandwiched in, but if I could just focus on those for a minute, uh, you, I think you'll get a, you'll get a uh, I believe, a fair and uh, overview of what we're up against here. Voter identification laws uh, was a strategy uh, by Republicans, and I'm not just picking on Republicans, but by damn, if, if, if it's not the Republicans leading suppression today, then um, and if you, you think otherwise, then we're on a different planet. Uh, Republican strategy of suppression uh, charge voter fraud and implement ID laws to purge to protect the election integrity and, and have maintenance, maintenance of voter rolls. All right, so it's always under cover of integrity. It's race neutral. Trump declared, remember, he declared that millions of illegal votes were cast for the Democrats by aliens, I guess, and he, he did not, uh, and that is why he did not win the popular vote. So what does he do? Do you remember what he does? So he uh, commissions a study uh, called the, uh, the Federal Election, uh, Elections Fraud Commission because he maintained, and those people around him, his advisors said, well, what you're seeing is a pattern of, of fraudulent behavior, primarily by people of color, and that is what's un gonna undermine the integrity of our democracy. And so that became the rationale for then uh, starting to have voter identification laws. Now there's no one in this room is gonna argue that, well, we shouldn't have you know, proper and legal uh, types of registration, but I would argue how you go about that is really the difference. So uh, 34 states require now IDs, voter IDs, can, and which can actually, you look at it, they can actually curate who gets to vote. For instance, some states can, will, will, can accept a hunting license as, a, as an ID, a proper ID, but they may reject a college ID. That's curation. That is definitely curation. About 10% of uh, Americans don't have recognized IDs. And then the Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, I, I know some of you know of this person, I call him the poster boy of suppression, uh, propose that a proof of citizenship should be required on all people who are want to register to vote. A proof of citizenship. Fortunately, the Supreme Court under Roberts blocked that in 2019, and they blocked it for the right reasons. So this election fraud commission that Trump, uh, Kobach, and uh, Vice President Pence chaired uh, met for about a year and a half. You remember what happened? Anybody recall what the... It dissolved. It dissolved. There. Why? There was nothing there. They didn't find anything. They found no significant evidence of fraud, uh, and the commission disbanded. The Washington Post reported a study uh, of, uh, of voting patterns from 2000 to 2014. They looked at uh, one billion votes cast and they found 31 cases of fraud. One billion with 31 cases of fraud. And some of those, according to this article, where they were 
questionable. Federal court ruled against North Carolina's ID laws because it acted with, quote, and I'm quoting the, the, the case, surgical precision to exclude people of color. This was in, in 2016. One judge, when looking, reviewing a, a petition in Wisconsin, said he found little or no evidence uh, of voter fraud, quote, some evidence of impersonation was, impersonation is the issue of voter fraud. Some evidence of impersonation was downright goofy, if not paranoid, unquote. That's a federal judge. Interesting, what, what, so what's the impact of these, these uh, ID laws? A according to a study, uh, uh, one study done in 2017, Democratic turnout drops by 7.7% with strict ID requirements it drops by 4.6% for Republicans. For strong liberal areas, the drop is 10.7%. For strong conservative areas, the drop is 2.8%. Government Accounting, Accountability Office, in a 2012 study, concluded that voter ID laws contributed to lower turnouts for minorities, young, and poor in two key states, Kansas and Tennessee. And I'm not going to go through, uh, I, I do have some, a, a bunch of other methodologies used for suppression, but I'm going to go on to voter <coughs> purging. When you charge somebody a voter fraud, it leads to purging of voter rolls because we think that the rolls are, lack integrity. So it gives you the license to then purge, to clear out those, those voter rolls. And according to the patterns that we've seen developing, developing certainly uh, in the 2000s, is the, targets, the target are minorities and the poor. In 2005, uh, Chris Kobach, again, uh, developed the cross-check system, interstate cross-check program, voter purging methods developed by Kobach, adopted by 30 states, uses an aggressive system that flags same names or double registrations. Now the problem with that is uh, in, in minority uh, communities, you have a, a higher pattern of, of similar names than you do in a, in a white middle class neighborhood. By 2014, excuse me. By 2014, cross-check targeted 7.2 million voters for purging with strong racial bias against blacks, Asians, Hispanics as these minorities were more likely to have similar surnames than whites. Georgia had an 11% purge rate with an exact match standard. Your name had to be exact. New, New Hampshire, and I'm not sure, this was in 2018, uh, now requires a P.O. box for proof of residency. Is that true, Tim? That is, and it really upsets a lot of students. Yes. Uh, yeah. Brian Kemp, the, the Secretary of State of Georgia, uh, who was a candidate uh, uh, for governor, purged 1.5 million voters from 2012 to 2016. And then Kemp uh, purged, in 2018, 53,000 voters. 70% were African Americans. My, my. A former head of the Civil Rights Division of the DOJ said that an enormous voter suppression campaign through voter purges is happening. And it's interesting to see, 50 years after the magnificence of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, we have the first election with no, absolutely no protections anymore because of Shelby. And the, the uh, voting right rate for blacks dropped 14% in, 19, in 2016. So why is this happening? Why, so we, we have this surge of use of racial politics today. You have these unbelievable uh, verbal attacks on countries and on individuals, on communities, on immigrants coming in. Well, why is that happening? What, what could possibly be gained by attacking individuals or groups of individuals in society? Now, I'll give you some, uh, a little bit of a political analysis of this. And 
Um, this is, um, I, uh, there was a long, long pieces in the New York Times on this. This, this animosity, this targeting of individuals, minorities, serves to further alienate people of color from the system. It does two things. It er erodes their confidence that this system works for them at all. That why should I vote? No one cares about me. I've got a president that's disparaging me and my people. That's what the New York Times called it's the new Southern strategy. If blacks voted at the 08 rate and the, and the 2012 rate, in 2016, Democrats would have won Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, and they would have won the election. Don't misconstrue what I'm saying here. I'm not advocating for the Democrats. I'm, what I'm doing is criticizing the system. People can confuse that. So what the, the upshot is, we undermine the confidence of the entire system. And when you do that, it's very simple. Why the heck should I vote? Uh, either it's not going to be counted, or it's going to be, uh, I'm going to be purged, or, the, or you name it. In 2016, a Gallup poll uh, polled Americans. They said 70% of Americans believe the system lacked integrity, our electoral system. A Harvard study in 2012 and then again in 2014 uh, by the Election, Election Integrity Project at Harvard ranked, ranked the United States 52nd out of 153 countries regarding integrity the greatest democracy in the world. I would argue, too, that uh, one of the dangers is that we have a partisan, partisan-controlled electoral system. The, the secretaries of state in 36 states control, through their party, how, this, how the election should be run as opposed to having, and some states are now are, are merging with neutral. This would be a nonpartisan, as much as you can do it, I know that's difficult, uh, ways to run the election. It should not be in the hands of a Democrat. It shouldn't be in the hands of a Republican. So a, a partisan Secretary of State can establish the registration procedures, the hours, the methods of voting, and choose the machines that they want to use, and some that won't have paper trails. According to uh, and if you look at the 2000 election in Florida, uh, who oversaw that Secretary of State's election, you remember the name Kath Catherine Harris? Well, so she was the Republican control of that election, but she was also the vice chair of Bush's re-election campaign, or his election campaign. In 2008, and I, don't, I couldn't get any updated figures on this, but 2018, 12 states still had electronic machines with no paper trail. Vermont's is marvelous. Simple little machines, you've all seen them. Sucks it in. And I've been, in, I've been involved with re -election, or, uh, uh, election recounts in the state a uh, number of times. And there it is. It's right there. It's all hard copy. And the last uh, major view of, of how we can, our, our strategy for uh, limiting the franchise is the gerrymander. And we all know that to a certain extent. The first one was in 1788. Patrick Henry tried to gerrymander um, James Madison out of the House of Representatives. It failed. But, but the portmanteau, portmanteau of, of gerrymander is Elbridge Gerry, 1812. He was a governor of Massachusetts. And he, and he wrote it to favor the Democratic slash Republican Party, as, it, as that party was called. Over 30 states have gerrymandered and voter suppression laws. Again, minority students and low-income people are targeted. We have custom-designed or designer uh, voting districts. And, and in 2016, these custom-designed voter districts gave the Republicans a 22-seat 20, 20, advantage in the House of Representatives. Gerrymandering has caused, and this is the Center for uh, Politics, Study of Politics at University of Virginia, gerrymandering has caused an extremely high percentage of non-competitive congressional races. Non-competitive, kind of like Vermont, in a way. Uh, only 75 districts were competitive out of 435 in 2016. Only 75 out of 435. 
gerrymandering creates a high recidivism rate. That's what I call it. You know, it's a, a re-election rate. Incumbents won re-election in 2016, 97% of the time uh, in the House and 93% of the time in the Senate. So, um, and by way of concluding, big sigh of relief, uh, by way of concluding, I just want to talk about some more structural kinds of uh, weaknesses that I see in the system. And these are some a little more abstract, it take more, more time to, uh, to uh, argue, but you know, since you all uh, know and respect me and trust me, you just take my word for it. Um, seriously, corporate control of the legislative process, we know undue influence does not expand democracy. I'm not going to go into the, the, the details of that, but I'm just throwing that out as a, as a, as a construct corporate media. Uh, we have systems of now that are, our, news, our news is siloed or it's, in, it's tribalized. I will only listen to the stuff that I agree with. You will only listen to yours. So we have, the, we have the cable news, we have internet news and such, and that is dangerous. That is so dangerous. If I had to pick one thing that I think is the most problematic, it would be that. It would be that. And that reminds me of what Jefferson said. If you had a choice between a, a free press and a free government, you would want to have a free press. You know why? Because you couldn't have a free government without a free press. Uh, winner take all representation as opposed to a uh, proportional representation, like many uh, uh, European societies all, all do, parliamentary system. The Census Bureau is problematic as, as the, uh, the current administration attempted to politicize that with the, the insertion of a, as I, as I made reference to before, a citizenship clause. 130 federal programs use census data for funding requests. So if you want to make it inaccurate, if you want to have lesser counts of people of color, of poor people in areas, that's a good way to really inviscerate those programs. In 1940, the census was used to identify 120,000 Japanese Americans who were then forced into camps. We know about cyber attacks. That would be that's six lectures in itself. But let me just tell you something that the New York Times re reported a week and a half ago, that 50, all 50 states in all 50 states in 2016, Russia attempted to hack into the election system. They didn't get into all of them by any means. A hundred federal, state, and municipal governments have been hit by ransomware. Twenty percent of voting machines have Chinese-made components. There have been a thousand hacking attempts into leading Democratic campaigns in the last two months. Trump's uh, funding for security for all of this is $350 million. The Harvard Belford Center says that is a mere drop in the bucket. Okay, I'm going to conclude uh, this way. I think all of these things are important. I think they're all surmountable. We've won some, we've lost some, and we'll keep doing it under, under a viable democracy, or it will be, or we will not have a viable democracy. But I think the most, val the most uh, important act of voter suppression is that we don't give people a reason to vote. The United States, you know, has one of the lowest voter turnouts of the industrialized world. So in 2000, we had a 54% turnout. In 04, we had a 60% turnout. In 08, these are, uh, we had a 62. In, in 12, we had a 57, and last time a 61.8%. Now, if you look at uh, other countries, Australia, 95%, Belgium, 94, Germany, 93, and that powerhouse of all powerhouses, Malta, has a 94% rate. Um, we could get into campaign finance. I can't do that now. That's another 12 hours of lecture. Uh, there, there, as, as, 
as part of what I want to do here is that there are there are very there are openings there are bright signs that we can exploit we do that uh, every time we can um, the Democrats as we know won the 2018 election an extraordinary uh, turn of events um, the uh, I, I guess where I would like to go with this is that our democracy only uh, will only survive if we make it survive, if, if we work at it. And I would argue that elections every two years isn't good enough. We have to have democracy in our workplaces, we have to have a democracy in our schools, we have to have democracy everywhere in our institutions. Voting, obviously very important, but that's not the only thing. I mean, we have to organize our communities, we have to organize uh, in our neighborhoods. For every act of voter suppression, there is, an, there is a democratic reaction because we won't let it happen. None of us would let it happen, unless, of course, you like what's going on. And uh, I, don't, I don't know where a lot of you people stand, but uh, so that's, that's uh, my conclusion. Let me just conclude with uh, Frederick Douglass again. And it's a famous quote that you know. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. Sound familiar? They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Let us roar for our democracy. Thank you. So thanks, Tim. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm impressed with your optimism because, you know, a lot of the facts that you share are very disturbing to me. Um, I'll make sort of one observation and then turn it into a question. That, um, that elections are fully regulated by the states seems really bizarre and perplexing to me. Um, I don't know how that um, can be changed. But it, my question to you is the Electoral College is, you know, is, is baked into the Constitution as a really fundamental element. It seemed to be put there to balance the interests of small states and large states. And uh, it's resulting in uh, a big disparity between uh, popular votes and electoral college such that um, we get minority administrations. Do you see any any way to reform the electoral college that's viable? Um, yes, and, and this is um, <coughs> to me a, a grounding fundamental approach and that is we have to we have to change our campaign finance laws you do that, you democratize who represents us in Washington. You do that, you get different faces, different hearts, different minds, and then, more, then they'd be maybe more willing to consider alternatives to something that's been baked in, as you rightly say, for since the founders. So, yeah. And this is also not just a question and answer for me, it's rather, you know, just suggestions or, you know, hey, why don't we do this, or what have you, so. Um, thank you for the talk, yeah. Tim. Um, my name is Liam. I, I think the, the idea of, of reforming a system that was built in the 1780s when the fastest means of communication was the horse, mm -hmm. uh, by, by merely just tinkering with that scale of thinking mm -hmm. and not fundamentally reimagining what it's like to have a modern democracy, have an idea where the election cycle of every two years can't possibly keep up with the shifts of technology, the shifts of our society, with artificial intelligence, like, you know, all the things that <laughs> are so fast. Um, the modernization of, of our infrastructure that can also accommodate the paper recount, right? Like, 
I think that is um, a tune I'm not hearing in certainly political candidates, but not even in, uh, for the most part, the election reform. It's, it's talking about getting rid of Citizens United. Mm -hmm. Like, think bigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Citizens United just gets us back to a pretty shitty spot in the first place, right? Like, what is, right. what is the real ideal? And I think we have to be forward thinking in how we address the, uh, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's not just about fighting the bad guys, but becoming a society that has uh, a more minute by minute level of responding to our laws. <coughs> Mike Ravel had a, Mike Ravel was a political uh, Democratic candidate for the uh, presidency in 2008. Um, and he had this, this idea called the National Initiative, which was, hey, we, in many states throughout the country, we can put on a ballot, right. a law. You can also potentially impeach an official mm -hmm. from the popular vote, right. not from having to wait for your representatives to pass a law. I think that idea uh, was really novel, really cool, and that's just the, the starting point of bringing democracy into the modern day with still not just completely wiping out the <laughs> all the infrastructure. Right. There's there's a lot of cool things. I just wanted to bring that into the good. Uh, possible good. discussion. Yeah. Other thoughts? Uh, hi, my name is David Longsmith. Um, one of my greatest regrets in my life is uh, having Frank Bizarro as my history teacher and not Mr. Kip <laughs> when I went to BUHS. Um, I, I think you know there's a lot of complex ways to fix things like a national initiative and the electoral college being reformed. I think having a you know I, I re what really resonates for me to make it possible for people to vote more or to participate more is to have a voting day be a day when no one has to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is it Tuesday? It's not my idea, but it, you know it just seems like yeah. it's really smart. Um, yeah. Um, and. I don't know what the secret is to the countries that have 95% voting rates, but you know they they should get a long hard look as far as there, what, there are, what are the main responses to that. Things. One is, and it, I, I really concluded with it: they give people a reason to vote. They have a diversity of candidates, so we have a two-party system, functionally a two-party system. <coughs> and yes, there's di there's differences between the two, but there have been times when there's not a lot of difference. There's been a lot of consensus on war policies on welfare policies and so forth. I mean, you look at, you look at Clinton and he sounded more uh, conservative than, than any Democrat since, since uh, the 19th century, it seems to me. Um, and it, so we don't have a lot, there's not a lot of choice. If you look at these parliamentary democracies, you know, you have a far right party, a middle right, far left, middle left, moderate parties, labor parties and such. That gives people something to vote for. And they don't go on and on and on. This is a two-year absurd, absurd uh, election cycle. Four billion dollars was spent total in the 2016, including all the, dem re all the repu uh, presidential candidates and all the congressional candidates. Four billion dollars to get a turnout of, of what? Of 61%? Boy, if I was a capitalist, that's not a great return on my money. No. Except if you don't want. Unless if you don't want. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Australia has mandatory voting. It's a $10 fine. It's a $10 fine. <laughs> so, Tim, thanks for doing this. But I, I have a question, really, and is that the whole uh, discussion really revolves around race suppression. What you, the way you uh, elucidated this, it had to do with racial issues. Yes. But my question has to do with women. And my understanding is that they were essentially the last group to get the vote. Am I right? Women. Well, women. well 18 year olds. But, 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 but in 1920, okay, but, the 19th Amendment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So my question is. What's happening, in, and then you point out clearly that there's suppression of the vote related to race. 
But what's happening in terms of suppression of the vote related to women in this day and age? I, um, I don't know of any patterns and, and reasons to target women for that, unless they're women of color, unless they're poor women, are there less, are they women inclined to vote the way, uh, you know, towards more liberal candidates? Mm -hmm. Okay. In my own uh, estimation, I, I feel like the uh, single most powerful change that could be made that would address many of the problems you speak of, like a two parties, uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, is ranked voting. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that is not, um, I don't know how to get that, that through to uh, people. Is, uh, this, it has very, very little uh, understanding and support. And there is a funny part of that. Ranked voting would radically change the political system. And I have... I often have this feeling when I'm talking to people that when it comes to radical change, they back off. In spite of understanding and knowing how many deeply radical flaws there are right now, but change, uh, radical change is very difficult and frightening. Can someone explain yeah. ranked voting? Yeah, what is I don't know what that is. Uh, ranked voting is when, in a situation where you have more than two candidates, and when you have ranked voting, you usually end up with many more than uh, t two candidates for one position. And rather than vote for the one person that you want to win, uh, that's the winner-take-all system, you rank each candidate in the order of your preference. So what that effectively does is there are no more fringe candidates. A person no longer needs in electoral parlance to waste their vote mm -hmm. on a candidate they don't like just because they're trying to stop another one. You can always vote for the candidate that you really want because if that person isn't elected, then your second choice, which may be your mainstream candidate, will get your vote. And that, uh, that obviates the, the, uh, the canard about you are a, a spoiler. So you have someone who is an uh, alternative party candidate and I'm going to say a third or fourth in, in the race, and the first charge is, well, you're going to give the election to the other person, you know, whatever the ideological balance is there, opposition. So you are the spoiler, and that's always considered, like, you know, a death nail. Is it doing rank voting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Successfully. Yeah. We tried, uh, there was a, a strong initiative by progressives about 20 years ago, and my students were involved with it, and they actually testified <coughs> in the House. Uh, to have it have have it uh, implemented, and it was uh, Anthony Pen no Polina and um, people other uh, Dems up in Burlington, uh, Terry Baricious, early progressive in the state. We didn't get we didn't get enough support for it. Hi, I'm Stephen. Uh, caucusing is also uh, ranked voting the hard way. Right. Yeah. Um, so they're um, <laughs> just happening right now. Oh my God. That's right. <laughs> We all have to go to that side of the room or this side. <laughs> I, I don't want. I uh, don't want to diminish the power of a radical restructuring of this voting system because I think that really is what would make the real difference. But another s small tweak that could help. There's absolutely no reason why districting cannot be done in such a way as to optimize diversity. Okay. The, the, to essentially, no. To do it in. To, well, to uh, remove gerrymandering, which is the intentional shaping of districts to favor certain groups. The, the, the mathematics of optimizing diversity is well known and easy to do. So one way to use the, dis the census data for good would be to automatically and systematically create districts to optimize diversity. And 
do away with this because mm -hmm. I, I see this as one of the, the biggest ways that concentration of power is happening in our most recent elections. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I coupled that with can we can we uh, centralize? I know you know that's a tough sell these days to have the government take over a program. It's always been a problem for me as a socialist. How do I sell the fact I want government to have more power? Well, I don't want it to have more power if it's the government we have today. You know, so that's always been a conundrum for me. Uh, but if we could federalize, uh, more federalize that. So every person in the country votes on the machines that we have in Vermont, to, which are pretty foolproof. From talking to Elliot Greenblatt, who is the chair of the Board of Civil Authority, saying that they, these machines are virtually foolproof. Is that right, Lee? He's a JP, so would you concur with that? Yes. Uh, why, why isn't the whole nation doing that? And it's not plugged into some larger computer network that can be hacked by a Russian or a Chinese or whoever, some wingnut in, in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Um, the, uh, that, to me, would not be impossible to do. I didn't mean to pick on Wisconsin. Um, uh, I'm, I'm John, and I just want to ask Tim or anybody, what, what, if they know of efforts to respond to specific disenfranchisement in the, in the coming election, when somebody goes and their name's been purged, and who's, what kind of organizations are doing legal protections or supports? And there, is, there is a lot. There are 25 national or organizations nationwide that are fighting to preserve the ballot. 25 different nonprofits, legal, political organizations around this country that are doing that. I know, and we were we were doing uh, 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 canvassing in, uh, in Hinsdale the other day, and they and they said, well, what should you do if you're not registered, and, and or if they're challenging you, they gave you an outline of what what kind of redress you could have, and it looked doable. It looked, you know, it wasn't absolutely convoluted. So that, that, that felt like there were some protections built into that system. Um, and I, but I don't have any generalized view on that. I mean, I tried to get some in my research. And I said, what's, what's the 2020 election going to look like? Are we all in, up, up, up a creek? Uh, and it, it, there's no generalized, oh, yes, the, the, place is, uh, the system's so corrupted, so forth. I don't, I don't believe it to be that way. I think there's some serious weaknesses, uh, but with citizen action and, and people fighting back, you know, that's how we, that's how we, we maintain or, or you know, sustain Stacey, it. Stacey Abrams is, I think, the most public figure yes. who's working in, to, to safeguard and re recover those who have been purged, uh, because clearly she lost an election due to purging in, mm -hmm. in Georgia as she would be governor otherwise. Um, apart from her, however, I'm not, uh, I'm not really familiar with other groups in Latin that you think there are 25. Well, there are. And, uh, I didn't make that up. Oh. <laughs> but uh, um, I think that, you know, it's one of those things you, pull, you Google, right? And then you... I'd like to say that, you know, the, some of the younger generations, I'm not I can't help but wonder from talking with other people um, of younger generations than myself, they don't even know about early ballot. Like when I go and early vote and, you know, do that early, people are just like, what? Why are you wearing the stick? I said you already voted. And I, I think there needs to be more education around the fact that you don't have to be off that day. You can actually, in Vermont, and I'm not sure it's everywhere in the country, but you don't have to actually vote on one day. Uh, Tim, New Hampshire has the same day registration too. You mentioned that. Yeah. A Hinsdale, people in Hinsdale could register that same day. Yes, they, do they can. Take some identification yep. with them. And in some states have provisional balloting. Meaning, if there is a question about your uh, the veracity of your the legality of your ballot, you can you can vote, and then it's it's counted provisionally, and then they have time to then go back within a certain amount of time to verify that it's validity. Tim, I think that's all states have provisional. I no, I don't think so. 
Do you have any information on uh, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people voting? I know Florida yes, went through. Florida it. has, Vermont does, Vermont, Vermont also has, you can vote. I think there are two states that, that in prison you can vote, and Vermont is one of them. <laughs> Florida's under contest. Yes, well, that's right. Florida, yes. the legislature said, okay, go ahead. If the voters voted for it, you can go ahead and do it, but you have to pay your back taxes. Right. right, and there, yeah, so in terms of a, uh, a, work. a poll tax or a debt peonage system, there is right now ha that's happening. In, in a, what state is it? Florida. Is it Florida? Because I remember uh, reading about that. Yes. <laughs> Something kind of similar I think was, was happening with students in New Hampshire where they were trying to say that um, students couldn't vote unless they went through certain hoops to show that they were a resident, one being re-registering their car in New Hampshire within something like 60 days of the election, but there's a fee associated with registering your car, so that is sort of parallel to a poll tax. Exactly. Um, I think that they may have done away with that, I'm not sure. But there is some question as to how many students are gonna be allowed to vote where they want to vote. We'll see. All right. So uh, back on uh, Tim's question on uh, mass incarceration, in the United States, we're 5% of the world's population and we, we incarcerate 25% of the world's prisoners. We're 5% and we incarcerate 25%. 6.2 million ex-cons can't vote, black or white. 7.7% of blacks overall can't vote. 1.8% uh, of overall whites can't vote in the United States. For those states that even though you have paid your, for your crime and you're out, you may be working and living a civilized life, you are permanently disenfranchised. Yeah? So I'm having a hard time believing that we still have a democracy. Uh, so it seems to me, and I, I don't consider myself real knowledgeable as a historian, but it seems that the original structure, foundation of former government that we have and what we have now are so different that I, I want to know, I, I'm trying to understand what we really have now. Is it a different form of government? Is it, has it evolved to a point where maybe you could you know, nominally call it a democracy, but it's really something else. I, I don't know what it is anymore. Well, that's a long conversation, and, and it can border on the metaphysical. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you, if, in objective sense, if if you look at who gets to vote, by and large, the the uh, franchise has enlarged since since the founding. You know, in terms of women can vote, African Americans can vote, Native Americans can vote. So in that sense, but again, just like what I was talking about here. That democracy is not a static noun. It is a it is a condition that has to be fought for over and over and over again. So we we have these we have these retrenchment, the revanchist kind of movements. I would also say that it, this nation was never intended to be a democracy. It's always intended to be a representational voting system for those who have power. <coughs> And, that, and that's very clear. I mean, from the you know from the Constitutional Convention primarily yes. forward. And so, democracy, in my estimation, is something that we have to fight for if we're going to have it. And if we don't fight for it, we're not going to have it. And that's what the, you know the, the Tim's lecture, or the, the the blowback or the reaction is always, who does that? Who is it that behind the blowback? It, it's racially uh, driven primarily, white people. But white people are the original voters, right? The white men with property. And so they're always taking back, trying to get back to what the founders called it, a republic. And, and, and yet the, some of those founders imagined a broader and bigger day, and something that could be called a democracy. It, it, it slides back and forth. Um, so there isn't, it's like, was there ever communism, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. Um, Tim, you, you said, you know, the franchise has expanded. Yeah. And yet, uh, 
you mentioned five uh, elections where we had a minority. Right. Uh, and the trend prison. is, and trend is, it's going to be more like that. Right, and I, I know at least three of those are very modern. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. So the franchise is expanding, and yet we're not getting the publicly elected. There's a official fascinating White article White House. Uh, by a guy named Ezra Klein. It's in the. I gave you that article, I think. No, I, I gave it to somebody. Uh, New York Times uh, two weeks ago talked about the polarization of our society and our political parties. And they're saying in this study, and it just came out, I haven't had a chance to read the book, but I've read reviews and a long article in the Times, that the, uh, this politicalization, polit polarization is going to be getting worse in terms of who these pa the parties appeal to. There is a constriction of appeal on the Republican side and then there's a, there's a diversity, which is also problematic for the Democrats, according to this analysis. The, um, and so, uh, their, this author's prediction, political science, uh, is that we're gonna see more minority presidents as we go along. Another thing to layer on top of this is, by, in 20 years, we're gonna, whites are gonna be a minority in this society. That's scaring the hell out of a lot of people. And I think what we're seeing today in the national political scene is part of that, that perspective and that cauldron of the, the fear of what's happening to our society because the faces look different. I think one of the things that really made me feel inspired and hopeful um, was I know a number of people that are high up in this and they're civil servants in our government. And there's 2.7 something million civil servants who have um, gotten jobs and they, they're, they're not political and they have, you know, given an oath to follow these laws. Mm -hmm. um, and there's uh, our elect officials take up a lot of time in the news and everything else, but there's this, in, in all their chaos, but underneath there is this large group of people who are not, you know, politically affiliated. They may have political beliefs, but they're basically having to follow the laws right. as mm -hmm. they are. Um, and, and I think that that's um, hopeful, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it, I think without them and what they're doing every they, day. They can vote, but they can't, they can't advocate, they can't be public because of their role. In, in the no, and their job is their job. Right. That they, right. you know, so they're yeah. still doing their jobs, and it, it, it yeah. doesn't mean they're working for a political party. Right. I think that's important. Yes. So another question. In other democracies around the world, is there voter suppression? Is uh, I, haven't, I haven't studied that, but I, I, why not? Why, why wouldn't there be? call it in Australia? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, why wouldn't there be? If, if certainly, you know, what we're facing is a geographic and demographic shifts, and that's going to scare people. You look at Brexit. You look at those, the demographic, the, the motives behind that. Surely, surely. There's suppression at, um, efforts in every society where the, where the old guard wants to hold on to their power. They're not going to concede a thing. I would, I would posit that with multiple political parties, there's less need to do voter suppression. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear your fading I say, I, I would suggest that with multiple political parties, there's perhaps less need to do, or less ability to do voter suppression. And I would say that they don't have a one person in, a, in a, a body of the legislature calling the shots on whether or not we're gonna do a certain thing. We're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna deal with those 350 bills that are sitting on the, in, in Senate right, right. now. Uh, one person saying, no, we're not dealing with it. Right. Uh, a a multi-party system, a parliamentary system, is a much more pluralistic system. And so the competing forces, and I've always felt that democracy is not about trust, it's about distrust. And I don't, don't mis misrepresent me. I mean, don't, don't misunderstand me here. You can misrepresent me all you want. Um, is that, um, that we have to say, I am, I, I trust you, but I want to verify you. It's kind of like the old Reagan line. Is that we have to have these competing forces to make sure you're not, you're not screwing up or you're not, you're not breaking the law. And so those, those to me are real checks and balances, not the mirage that we're seeing now uh, in the federal government. 
Madison would be rolling in his grave, but maybe not. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of Madison. Yes. Um, um, thank you. I, I want to give full disclosure that I'm a census worker. And <laughs> um, so it's uh, always interesting to learn more about the census and um, you know, going, going to the question about, you know, you hear about this, you know, make America great again. And a question I hear a lot in response is like, when was it ever, you know, not made to keep the people in power in power? And um, the census certainly is a part of that. However, we do have control of how Vermont gets counted. I'm a recruiter in, in Wyndham County hiring census workers. I'm, I won't take up public our, our, our discussion time right now, but I have information if people are interested. Um, hugely important to be counted in our community. $4,000 per person in federal funding comes into the community, funding 62 different programs that uh, come into Vermont that receive federal funding. So um, thank you for uh, for uh, coming here tonight. And yeah, that's called great democracy, talk. isn't it? Yeah. It is. It's not voting for a particular party, but it is raising your hand to be represented in retrieving some of the federal money that we all pay out. Other, uh, we've been an hour and a half or so, and if people, uh, you guys can call it. You can fire us now or uh, buy us a drink. Or I have one question. Yes. You mentioned that you're hopeful, and the times are so dismal, and this list is so overwhelming, mm -hmm. and you mentioned the franchise ebbs and flows. Yes. Is it going to get worse before it gets better? Um, I hate those kind of predictions. I, I reside in the cowardice of being an historian. Uh, but if, but if I was hope? forced, where's if I hope? was forced to, I would say we still have a long way to go to make it get better. Um, and a lot will determine it on who's in control of the legislature. I mean, if uh, if there's more balance in the legislature, I think there's more hope for 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 reform. But in terms of optimism, I've been a political activist all my life. And I use this quote all the time, and I think I probably quoted it to you. Abraham Heschel, a uh, Jewish theologian, he, he, and he was busy, he was active, he was, he was a powerhouse all his life. He was asked about, how do you keep going at it? And he said, well, I'm a pessimist of the intellect, but I'm an optimist of the will. Hmm. I love that one. It keeps me going, as does these kind of dialogues. Uh, I guess I'm concerned on how activists can look at timing now that has been just in the last five to ten years. So uh, the technology has made it go so fast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that um, it's really discouraging mm -hmm. for someone who thinks that They've been doing what you've been doing for the last 30 years. You know, how do you actually, with the speed of everything going on, get your foot in the door right. to make things work? Well, you put your foot in there and don't, don't pull it out. I mean, and I don't want to be facetious about that, but you just have to keep, it, you just have to keep at it. You know, so I look around the room here and I see friends of mine that are doing many different things. Howard Zinn said social change, and I mentioned this this afternoon. Howard Zinn said social change comes about when millions of people do small things. But when you have millions of people that are uneducated in the manner in which to do it, I mean, what has been going on in the last six months is a basic education of the populace that uses Twitter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. people that have no idea of how they get uh, the idea of democracy understood by the populace. And, and, and then you, you have about Greta and mm -hmm. the young people who right. are doing the stuff that they're yes. doing, and they're using that technology yes. to do it. And yeah. that's what's going on. Wow, what a great example of what we're talking about. There's hope. There's hope for us.